Greetings, MBAP 516 Organizational Leadership and Behavior students. This is Dr. Jaros here with a video explanation for how I graded your third exam, uh, just because we don't have any class sessions left, so I can't do that, you know, via a Teams meeting or something. So let's look at question number one. What three subsystems characterize any complex organization? What roles do they play? Explain. Well, the three subsystems are the technical subsystem, the managerial subsystem, and the institutional subsystem. The technical subsystem consists of the core technologies where an organization converts inputs into a finished product. So a good example is a factory. And that's the role of the technical subsystem. Its role is to convert inputs like supplies and materials into a finished product like a car or a washing machine or iPhone or whatever the case may be. The managerial subsystem consists of middle level management. Their job is to basically take care of the technical subsystem. Specifically, they do three, the managerial subsystem does three things. It acquires the materials and supplies that the te technical subsystem needs. It disposes or sells of the products. It disposes or sells the products that the technical subsystem produces. And it governs the technical subsystem in the sense of supervising it and establishing its goals. Lastly, the institutional subsystem consists of the top management of the organization, the executives at the very top. Their job is to make sure that the organization maintains legitimacy in the eyes of the general society in which it is embedded in. So it's the job of the institutional subsystem to maintain good relations with customers, with communities and cities and states, and also government and regulatory agencies. That's the role of the institutional subsystem. All right, what about question number two? Should a manager seek to eliminate informal interactions that occur among their department subordinates? Explain. For the most part, no. Okay, and that's because for two reasons. First of all, Informal interactions are inevitable any time people are involved in working together. I mean, it's, it's simply an aspect of human nature that people will seek to socialize and relate with each other in ways that are not strictly professional and formal, even in a work setting. So it's futile to try to eliminate all such interactions. Second, informal interactions are often beneficial to an organization. They often arise to solve business problems that the formal rules and procedures have not accounted for. So if the manager did succeed in eliminating all informal interactions, then they might be causing damage to the organization by making it less productive and less efficient. That said, not all informal interactions are beneficial. For example, if one employee were to sexually harass another employee, that's an example of an informal interaction at work, but obviously that's not a good thing, and so management should seek to eliminate you know, those kinds of harmful informal interactions. Okay, let's look at question number three. According to the proposed principles of management, should communication among employees within an organization within an organization be primarily written or verbal in nature? Explain. Well, according to Henri Fail, the author of the Principles of Management, communications among employees should primarily be verbal. Now, you know, primarily doesn't mean 100%. He does recognize that sometimes communication should take written form, but primarily it should be verbal. And that's because he believes that most of the time, written communication is inefficient, meaning it takes more time and it tends to produce a lot of you know, unwanted red tape and paper waste. And also, he believes written communication is more prone to misunderstandings, which can lead to conflict and disagreement among employees, which harms their 
teamwork and, and overall performance. So, you know, primarily communication should be verbal, but, you know, not all the time. Last but not least, what is asset specificity as it applies to human assets? And what role does it play in determining the nature of the employment relationship between the employee and the firm? Well, asset specificity as applied to people refers to two things. It refers to the degree to which an employee's skills are firm specific and also the degree to which it is easy for management to determine how productive an employee is. What Williamson calls metering. Okay. You know, some jobs, by their very nature, it's easy to determine whether an employee is doing well or doing poorly. Like, let's say my job is to make um, 100 units of a widget per, per, per hour. Okay. Well, that's a job that is pretty easy for management to uh, meter. You know, a manager can periodically come by and count up the number of widgets that I've made. If it's more than 100 in an hour, I'm doing a good job. If it's less, I'm doing poorly. But other jobs, it's harder to determine whether the employee is doing well or not. Like, for example, me teaching this class. You know, um, who's to say whether I've done a good job teaching you guys this semester or not? You know, you might have an opinion about it. I might have an opinion about it. But, you know, those are just opinions. It's hard to prove you know, in kind of a scientific or mathematical sense, whether I've done a good job teaching this class or not. So that's a, that's a job that's less easy to meter or measure. And also the issue of firm-specific skills. A firm-specific skill is a skill that is valuable to a particular firm, but is not generally useful to any other firms. What, what Williamson says is, if the nature of a job is such that skills are not firm specific, meaning the employee skills are valuable to a wide variety of organization. And it's easy for management to measure how productive the employee is, then they don't really need to have any kind of fixed employment relationship at all. This is like characteristic of day labor, where companies hire employees on a daily basis, but they do not have permanent jobs. That's good for both the employee and the organization. But on the other extreme, if the skills that an employee has are firm specific, meaning they're valuable to our firm, but not to any others, and the nature of the job is such that productivity is difficult to measure, then both sides have an interest in a deeper kind of relationship. The organization is going to want to offer that employee a permanent job so that they don't take their firm specific skills elsewhere. And the employee, in order to have an incentive to invest in firm specific skills, is going to want a job with a lot of security, like, you know, a good wage, uh, freedom from being lay laid off, and like a good pension plan. All right. I hope my explanation for how I graded the exam, your third exam, has been helpful. And good luck in the rest of the courses that you are taking this semester. And to those of you who are graduating this semester, congratulations.